Good day, everybody, and welcome to the Michael and Patty Show, all about living in PEI, covering real estate and everything else you need to enjoy on our wonderful island here in Atlantic Canada. Today, we've got a subject that's named after a movie, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. If you haven't seen the movie, you should check it out. It's with John Candy and Steve Martin. It's super hilarious, and I guarantee you this podcast probably won't be anywhere near those standards, will it, Patty? No, I would agree. So today, we're talking about Planes, Trains, automobiles and we're going to throw in electric cars boat ferries bridges and what else i guess that's about it oh travel for the human mind we're going to talk about culture shock we'll leave that for last so you'll have to remind me okay sounds good so essentially what we're going to cover in this podcast is we'll start with flying to pei you're accessing pei through multiple means so basically in PEI, if you're not aware and you're thinking about visiting, we have one major airport and that's in Charlottetown. The one thing to keep in mind about Charlottetown is there is no U.S. Customs. So if you are flying in, or I should say Canadian Customs, so if you're flying in from an international airport, you'll probably have to traverse through Halifax, Toronto, Montreal. Does Moncton have Canadian Customs? No, I don't believe so. So keep that in mind. If you have a private plane, we also have an additional airport near Summerside called Slevin Park, which is an ex-military airport. It has about 11 or 12,000 foot runway, so it will accommodate just about anything if you're fortunate enough to have your own private plane. And when it comes to Cessnas, there is a number of grass landing strips, probably the most predominant or well-knowns in Cable he Head East, which is just north-northeast of Charlottetown. How about driving here? What's the drive like here, Patty? What do you have to do to get here by car or truck? Well, the two modes of transportation by vehicle would be either the bridge, the Confederation Bridge, or by ferry, which I have done the ferry more often in the last couple of years, which really does take off a lot of your travel time and your fuel consumption if you're heading to Halifax. The ferry is located in Wood Islands, which is east of Charlottetown by, what, a half an hour? Uh, It is almost an hour. It's 50 minutes from Charlottetown. Okay, so about 50 minutes. But when you look at the map, when you go to, say, Halifax, which is where most people are going, or alternatively, Moncton, you're driving all the way to the bridge. Moncton, it makes sense, but if you're going to Halifax, you're kind of traversing back the way you just drove. So the ferry makes more sense, but it also takes more time. In addition to the ferry that leads us or brings us to Nova Scotia, there's one additional ferry. Tell us about that one. The additional ferry that takes us to Nova Scotia? No, it goes somewhere else. To the Madeline Islands, and there is one that goes to Newfoundland, but that's from Cape Breton. So there's one additional ferry in PEI, and that comes out of Surrey, which is far east from Charlottetown, almost at the end of the island, which is where East Point is. And that brings you to a island that's part of Quebec, and I'm probably pronouncing this wrong, Madeleine. I think you've done a good job. Islands, which is an interesting place. And then, of course, if you want to go to Newfoundland, you can't do that from PEI via ferry or aircraft, for that matter. Chartered, you would have to go to Cape Breton. As far as the rail in PEI, where you don't have to worry about catching a train when you're on the island because there is no railway. What's happened there, Patty? Where did it go? It has been turned into our Confederation Trail. I do not know how many years ago it was all removed. However, that the trail system infrastructure on our island is originally the the train the train route. My understanding is at one point there's some federal grants or federal money that came in that basically allowed the island to put railway tracks just about everywhere. You still see the remnants of those today. And one little helpful tip is if you go to the PEI government website, they have online all the aerial obliques, which will show you typically black and white photos from aircraft that go back as late as the 1940s. Have you seen those? Yes, I've seen those. So those are really interesting because it also shows you all these railways and it shows you how industrial Charlottetown and Summerside were at some point. You can still see the remnants of where there used to be railways by looking at the width of some of the roads that lead down to the water. 
They're super, super wide, and it's not because they had an excess or surplus of pavement. It's because there's multiple tracks leading down to the water to access the boats. So those trails are now used for human purposes. What can we do on those trails? Well, the trails are, there's a a site that those who choose to travel to the island and those who are residents here, there's a contest every year that gets done to see how much of the trail and how many stops. I guess there's a card that you can have that gets uh, stamped at the different locations or you're to collect items. So there's a lot of fun things that they try to incorporate, but just biking, walking, hiking, uh, snow sh- um, snowshoeing, as well as uh, skiing, cross-country skiing is they're used for. They're not supposed to be used for snowmobiles. Well, they can be used for snowmobiles. Snowmobiles, when they're doing the cross-country skiing, can ruin the trails. I am sure they are used for it, but it is preferred that they were not. They can't be used for ATVs. So if you're looking for information on ATVs, the ATVs actually have three or four different associations on the island that I'm aware of. And it's quite well organized. So if you're traveling by ATV, or if you want to get into that hobby, you want to check out the ATV associations that are in the area that you're interested in. So the rail trails are a great place for walking, cross-country skiing, albeit snowmobiling, yes and no. And exploring the island from tip to tip. That's what I was going to say. There are people that have their bicycles rigged up with a little tent that will spend days or weeks traversing the island on the island trails and sleeping just off the trail in someone's farmer's field, (laughs) having skunks attack, attack them and raccoons eat their food. Okay. We don't have bears or moose yet. What else? As far as roads in PEI, we have our primary highways are labeled 1, 2, 3, and 4. Right? Yep. And we have something else you may want to check out. This is an interesting little nugget, and that would be the historic roads. Have you checked any of those out? The ones that are clay that I would not, I'd rather not drive down? Those are the ones. These (laughs) are awesome, awesome ventures. In fact, there is at least one Facebook group that covers explicitly the historical roads. They're usually clay. They're usually not something you want to go down in the spring, unless you've got five other people to pull you out. They're usually very narrow and accommodate one vehicle, but they're certainly very interesting, and you can get into all kinds of trouble super fast. Which brings me to my next point. We get to the island. Do we just show up at a car rental place and hope there's a car there? No, unfortunately, it's not so simple. There is no car rental facility at the Charlottetown Airport, at least not that I'm aware of. Actually, there is. Is there? Which one is it? I don't know, but yes, you can you can rent cars either at the airport, to the best of my knowledge, and you can correct me if I'm wrong via email or whatever. And there's also rental agencies in Charlottetown in and throughout the island. The one thing I would caution if you're coming to the island, which I would typically do anyway, is always reserve your vehicle. And if you do want to go down those historic roads or you want to go to the beach or you want to go anywhere in PEI, I always recommend some form of all-wheel or four-wheel drive vehicle that has some clearance. I wouldn't suggest if you're going to be coming to PEI and you're going to be touring the island to be renting a Toyota Camry or a Honda Civic or something, which are great vehicles for a paved road, but not necessarily great when you're going down a clay road that has holes in it that are a foot deep or more and water up to your waist. Patty? No, absolutely. And there's there's an app, I think it's called Turo, that allows private individuals to rent their vehicles out. Uh, we can confirm what that actual app is, but that's great because I know there's even a few within my industry, real estate um, agents, that actually do participate in that and have rented their vehicle out. There are options out there. That's like an Airbnb for car. Correct. And the other thing is, as far as trails, are we restricted to the rail trails or are there any others we can check out while we're here wandering around aimlessly with nothing to do all day? There's trails. Cavendish has its own trail system. The Bonshaw uh, National Park has its own. There's there's quite a few 
smaller trail systems, which are still good sized trail systems that are not a part 100% of the Confederation Trail. Have you seen the All Trails app? I, I think it's called All Trails. Yeah, I have looked at that many years ago. I just don't usually, I'm a busy realtor. I don't have time to be hiking a lot of times. So I enjoy my preferred walk in Charlottetown is along the waterfront as well as going through Victoria Park. It's such a picturesque, you get to see the sailboats sailing. You, It's just such a nice energy Lots of people out there with their dogs, you know, walking their walking with their children, the parks. It's a really pretty walk. So that's where I usually gravitate towards. And if you did want to go off the beaten path away from the Charlottetown waterfront, you can check out All Trails. I believe that's the name of the app. If not, I'll put it in the description. And that lists all the trails on the island that aren't part of the public or park system or whatever the case may be. Now, let's say I'm moving to PEI, Patty. I've taken the advice from the other podcasts, and I've hired a moving company from PEI to move my stuff from Ontario rather than hiring an Ontario company to move to PEI because I'm hiring what essentially is an empty truck. But I get here, and I've got a BMW, a Mercedes, a Lexus, a Jaguar, and, of course, I have two Lamborghinis. Can I get these serviced on the island? I was just thinking that. Good luck getting them serviced on the island. One thing to consider when you do move to PEI is that we have the standard brands. You know, Ford, Honda, Toyota, Chrysler, General Motors, Mazda, Nissan. And that's about it. If you're into the luxury brands or brands that aren't the mainstream it can be very expensive and timely to get your vehicle serviced. For instance, what about your friend with the Tesla? When, you know, Tesla had a story, if your vehicle ever broke down in the Maritimes, they got, in quotes, a guy that drives all over the Maritimes that will fix your Tesla. What did your friend find out when one of her motors died? Well, not only do they not drive around and do that, they were also supposed to be covering the towing to Halifax because that's where their main hub is for repairs, and they didn't. So it uh, it was a hefty tow. It was over $1,000 for the tow there and back? Just there. That's all that was That was just part there? Of it. Yes, and she's still trying to figure all that out. So, so it was $2,000 round trip plus the time, and then the car comes back, and hopefully it works. Maybe it won't. Keep these things in mind if you're moving to PEI. Sometimes it might be better to have a vehicle that's easily serviced depending on the brand. There's nothing worse than paying $2,000 for a tow to Halifax to find out you need another $1,000, $2,000 worth of work done. And then you get it back and then there's another problem that's got to go back. You get the point. Now, as far as planes we've covered, trains are gone, cars... However, we talked about the ferries, so we didn't talk about costs of the ferries, and we didn't talk about the bridge. Well, this cost is basically the same. When you said the ferry went up, it used to be the same. The ferry, so if you're doing a return, a round trip, it's $89 just for a, a vehicle with, you know, a couple people. They do end up charging, depending if you have a car load per person. Do I have to reserve? Yes, you do need to go online to the ferry website and able to get that reserved and pre-booked. If you don't pre-book, it's not mandatory, but you do run the risk of possibly not getting on and you're not avoiding paying. You still have to pay. So it just makes sense to pay for your your ferry uh, fee and then be able to you get into one of the special lines. These are the guys that pre, pre-registered pre for their ferry pass. What so. color are they, the guys that let you on the boat? <laughs> Don't know uh, different right. colors, like on a military sure. aircraft carrier. So what about the bridge, Michael? What about it, Patty? So, can, can I walk across the bridge? Not technically. No, they'll shut you down. They There's will a... bust you. They'll throw you on the ground, put handcuffs on you, stick you in the back of an F-150, and you'll end up at straight crossings head off yeah. as being interrogated as to why you're crossing the bridge by foot. So there is a bus that goes back and forth, correct. 
So that is one option if you were being dropped off in New Brunswick near the bridge or if you're able to get transportation to the bridge and you have someone picking you up on the other side. There, Like you said, there is a shuttle bus there that will take you across. They do do events. There is There are events that they do fundraisers for, which consists of walking across the bridge. I have not taken part. It is something that I would be very much interested in, maybe. On my little list of things to do, I might do that. With regards to the the length, how long is the Confederation Bridge? By memory, 8 miles, 12 kilometers approximately, and it costs, what were we up to, $56 or something now? $50.25. Is that both ways? No. That's a good question. So you only pay to leave the bridge. So To leave you, the island. To leave the island, sorry. If you have children, the nice peace of mind is, and it was my little entertainment joke when I had first moved to PEI in 2009, was if my children didn't have approximately $50 and then enough money for the shuttle, which back then was about $12, they were not leaving the island. So if they were off exploring, I knew they were at least somewhere safe on PEI. So... Well, the bridge came in handy during COVID because we could essentially close the island, even though, although this kind of sounds funny, people were smuggling humans in in the back of tractor trailers with produce and stuff. Yes, they actually were. They were being smuggled in. There was a place in Borden where the unload was being done uh, for them. Now, the RCMP did become aware of this, but yes, trafficking people Onto PEI. Struggling humans in. Yes. Shipping yourself in via UPS. <laughs> so the bridge is, some things you need, need to be aware of with the ferry and the bridge, not to focus on these topics, is the ferries are seasonal, so they're not going to run in the middle of the winter. The bridge is open 99% of the time. If there's high winds, any low-sided vehicles are allowed, any high-sided vehicles, I hope you have sleeping quarters in your truck because that's where you may be living for the next few hours or a day until the winds go down. They typically do not close the bridge 100%. I haven't seen it closed too often. Everything in PEI is monitored with cameras. I shouldn't say everything. A lot of the main highways, the bridge, straight crossing, the company that owns the bridge has cameras on the bridge so you can sit there and watch it all day long like I do on a big screen TV, see who's entering the island and leaving. Hi, there's Billy just left. Must be going to Costco, phone him up or... 10 packages of toilet paper. Also, the roads have uh, cameras on them. So that's a helpful thing as well. And then, of course, there's mapping systems that will show you what the traffic is like in PEI. But for the most part, the only traffic you're going to run into is during planting and harvest season where there's a bunch of tractors in front of you. Culturally speaking, Moncton, Halifax, Toronto... PEI, are they all the same culturally? Maritimes as a whole, there is an underlining, yes, maritime culture. But I would say each province is unique with its own heritage, its own um, cultural, just trying to think of the how I would describe it. They each have their own customs. They each have their own behaviors, their own traditions. What would you say? One of my clients is a psychiatrist or psychologist, and he said to me once, he said, there's significant cultural differences even between Halifax, Moncton, Toronto, Vancouver, PEI, and you even mentioned or didn't mention uh, your knowledge of Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. Is it the same as PEI? No, not at all. So there's cultural differences everywhere you go. I think it's important to pick up on those things, and one of the things I probably wouldn't do is come to PEI and tell everybody you're from Ontario. That, especially 15 years ago, was not a smart thing for me to have done and try to infiltrate into the island, become an island resident. Those who are not from here, which you and I both are not from Prince Edward Island, we are called CFAs or come from a ways. Um, we like to call ourselves islanders by choice. Uh, we weren't born here. We came here because we think it's absolutely beautiful. There is an island mentality that, you know, change, it needs to be slow. Whereas in some... I think it's, I don't think it's that. I think it's more so that people from Ontario, specifically Toronto, think they're, 
the center of the universe, which we're from there. So we know that it is, in fact, the center of the universe <laughs> and the true capital of Canada. Ottawa has nothing to do with anything. It's just some place up north. But it's important. The point to that is it's not a badge of honor to say where you're from. Just blend in. And I think that comes down to anything in PEI. You'll find people are pretty low-key and they blend in. It doesn't matter how much money they have. They aren't be living in a 20,000-square-foot home and driving a $3 million Bugatti Veyron that, of course, they can't get any service for because they're on the island and have to ship it to Montreal. Yeah, no, absolutely. And island islanders, I mean, they, when you think about it, they have been taking care of this land for many, many years. We come here as guests and then we want to make all these big ideas and changes and you need this and you need to do that. And we need to respect a little bit that, you know, their ancestors, this is, they've been here for a very long time. And so th that's where it kind of comes off as people can be a little bit pushy or, or islanders can see people from away as maybe being a little bit pushy and trying to push their ideas. Because culturally, they move at a different speed. Correct. Because it's a much higher pace. When you're living in New York City or Toronto or Vancouver or you know, Los Angeles, the pace at which you live is much cranked up, if I can use those words. There's always something going on. There's some event. There's friends that want to do this, friends that want to do that. Five o'clock in the morning, the QEW and the 401403, the ETR are packed with cars. 24-hour shopping. I used to do my shopping at three o'clock in the morning. It's just a different world. When you come here, you're going to live longer, look healthier, have a better life, but you can't run at that pace anymore because that's what's going to kill you. And that's exactly, Michael, why some people say PEI is not for me or the Maritimes are not for me. It's too slow. I'm used to having, you know, much more amenities and the city on 24 hours a day and not shutting down at, you know, 6 o'clock or, you know, in the summer, say 10, 11 o'clock at night. They're used to that kind of activity and, and life. One thing I will say, if you are looking to relocate to the Maritimes or, say, Prince Edward Island, because that's where I can reference and speak from, and you you were originally drawn because you were attracted to the slower-paced lifestyle and the friendliness of the people, well, if you choose to become a resident here, try to adopt that as part of your personality. I see many that come here, they love those characteristics and traits about the island, which is one of the wonderful things about islanders. They're so hospitable, but then they come with their their Ontario or, you know, any, wherever they've come here from, that mentality and, and they're rushing in traffic and they're cutting you off and they're giving you the finger. Yeah, they just, it's like they're, they're changing the island culture and if you want to be here, try to try to adopt some of these new, the new mindset, the new mentality of I'm going to slow down a bit and I'm going to, I know we're not allowed to let people in. So when I was about to say that, but at least be courteous, be courteous, friendly and kind. If I move here from Ontario, do I have to tint all my windows? You're not supposed to tint your side windows and your front windshield, but there are some that will black tint all the way around. Non-factory tinted windows are illegal. However, you see a lot of the cars from Ontario coming here with them. In closing, what else can we offer? Since we're completely unscripted and have <laughs> all these rabbit trails, two things I learned when I first came here is there's up west and down east. And the other thing, if you're driving and you want the tourist experience, stay off the main highways, follow the tourist routes. They're all marked. And having said that, the best resource for you, you're going to have a GPS because this is, you know, 2024 and everybody has a GPS. But in addition to that, pick up a tourist map. I would suggest visiting the Charlottetown waterfront, going down to uh, the old r railroad. Speaking of railroads, it used to be an old railroad terminal. So you're going to go there to get your maps and all your magazines and everything else. And if you walk Further, you'll find a bunch of restaurants and all kinds of stuff in the Yacht Club. It's all on the 
Charlottetown waterfront. The name of the location just escapes me right now. It obviously escapes you too. So rather than listening to silence, get the tourist map, stick to the tourist route. So if you're touring the island, you're going to find that most people in PEI or large populace are in Charlottetown, secondarily Summerside, and then Stratford's the quickest growing community. Then we've got Cornwall and up west, you've got Alberton, O'Leary, and Tignish. And to the east, we've got Surrey. What else is east? Georgetown. It's a smaller town. So that's pretty well it in a nutshell. Yes. And are you referring to Access PEI? No, I was referring to the uh, old railway station that has the tourist thing in there and all the restaurants where we had the... Founders Hall? Founders Hall, yes. Founders Hall. If you check that out first, and then walk along the waterfront towards the Delta Prince Edward, which you can see the hotel that's on the water... There's also restaurants and little places you can visit along there, shops, tourist information. You can pick up your PEI dirt shirt or whatever tourist stuff you want. And that's in Peak's Key as well. One thing that we'll end up maybe talking about next time, Michael, is just with regards to electric vehicles and the infrastructure and a little bit about about that, because I don't think we really got into that. We should actually cover that now, because we're not going to get into the debate whether they're good or bad for PEI. Electric vehicles... The government is very, very supportive of them. They're, they were giving or may still be giving rebates when you buy them. And they're also giving rebates to property or business owners that put chargers in. So we're probably, what Patty described PEI as, as, as a very progressive EV or electric vehicle environment. As far as our feelings on electric vehicles, we won't get into that, but I can tell you that batteries like the same temperatures as humans. So in our experience from the real estate agents we've come across that have adopted EVs, they've all said the same thing, that their range is greatly reduced because of the cold weather. In the winter. Your range in the winter will be reduced because of the cold temperatures, but as battery technology improves and they have heating and cooling systems that improve for the electric vehicles, that should change. But at this point, you're not going to get the range. And you do want to watch the EV charging map if you're going to be traveling in rural parts of the island. Yep, that's good. That's it. Be sure to subscribe or follow the podcast. Be sure to rate it with nothing less than six stars. Have yourself a wonderful day, and we really appreciate you listening. Thanks. Until next time, have a great day.